not a good one. And I had several friends show up today. I'm blessed today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's good, y'all. God is good. You know, we've been on this, we've been on this series. What what week is this week four? This week four, we're week four. Wait, what? 37? Week 37? That we're going right now. I don't know if you could be going for 37 weeks total as a church, but you know, hey, it's all good. But we are on, we're on week four of this, this idea that God's placed us and positioned us for purpose. Amen. That 2019 is our year. Come on. Come on. Our year as a church, our year as individuals, our year for God to place us and position us and put us in a place for a purpose. Amen. Amen. Come on. So we've went, you know, we've, I'll go back and listen to all of them. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to recap much today. We're also going to do communion today um, at the end of service. Um, so yeah, so, but along this line that we've been talking about being positioned for purpose, you know, we found out that God does have a purpose for us, right? Come on, talk to me this morning. Don't leave me hanging. All right? Don't leave me hanging. Come on. I like that hat, Alec. Come on. You haven't got to come in church hat yet. Get one. Come on now. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so being positioned for purpose and being put in a place that God can use you, that He has something for you in 2019. He has a place that he's going to put you. It may be work. It may be individually. It may be with the church. Come on. We need some help with the church. Amen. Come on. We need some volunteers. Come on. That's what makes this thing run. You know, when we said this last week, you know, it's not about numbers. What's it about? It was here. Populating heaven. Come on. That's what we want to be about. Everything we do, everything that we go about, every, every place that He wants to put us is about populating heaven. Amen. 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 And there's a lot of people in Abilene that need a place in heaven. Amen. Amen. And so we've been talking about this, uh, this series uh, uh, about being positioned for purpose. And something that I want to talk about today is that, you know, God is looking for people. You know, it's one thing to know that He has a plan. And it's another thing to know that it's, you know, his plan obviously is better than our plan. Because I tried my plan for years and it didn't work. I, you know, I'm the only one. That's okay. I understand. I got it. I'm the only one that tried it my way. That's cool. But God, you know, I tried it my way and it didn't work. But he, and he has a plan. But, you know, it's another thing to say, God, I'm willing to be used. Come on, that's where we're at right now. God, I'm willing to be used. Everything, you know, I didn't even get to talk to Kirk this week. And I, man, I was praying this week that God would put him the right songs on there. And everything that he sang was exactly where we're going today. Because it's about everything that's inside of us. You know, we talk about that humble heart, right? We talk about a broken heart, how God's looking for a broken heart. The sacrifice that he wants isn't sacrifice, uh, something, that, something else that we can give him, some of our natural needs, but it's that broken heart that we have. <laughs> That thing that we can just pour out and say, God, everything's yours. You know, we said last week, we said that, uh, you know, a, a man who is, who is laid before God on his face can't fall from that position. Amen. When you're laid out before God and you're bowing before Him and you're on your face before Him, you can't fall from that position. You know, every place that I've tried to put myself, come on, every place that I've tried to put myself... I fell for it. Because it was selfishness. You know, we learned in, in our relationship, and I'm going I'm to hit this just, sec, just a little bit, but you know, we had our five series on, on love and relationships, right? And, and we talked, what was the one thing that, that, that hurts a marriage more than anything? Selfishness. selfishness. You're married to Christ. You're married to Christ. So what do you think is going to be the one thing that's going to hurt this relationship? Come on. Selfishness, right? I want to do what I want to do. I want to go where 
I want to go, right? But God's looking for people with a humble heart, with a broken heart, that will just lay out before you. <laughs> so, if you've got your Bibles, open them up. We're going to go to uh, we're going to go to several different scriptures today. Um, but we're going to start out at 2 Chronicles 16.9. We've got it up here. Uh, if, if you didn't bring your, your smartphone or, or anything else that you've got, it, get it out and take notes. You know, take that phone out if you didn't bring something to write it down. Take notes. Let God talk to you this morning. Amen? Amen. Come on. As we take notes, you know God's talking to you, right? As you're putting stuff down and things are running and you're remembering and you're trying to write stuff down, God's talking to you. And so what you write down may not be exactly what was said, but it's exactly what God said to you. Amen? So 2 Chronicles 16.9 And I'm reading out of the New Life version. And it says this. It says, For the eyes of the Lord move over the, all the earth, so that He may give strength to those whose what? Whole heart is given to Him. You know, everything that we have, God's, God's looking right now. And his eyes are going on. He's like, you know what? I just, I need, I need somebody. I need somebody that will just give me their whole heart. I, I, don't need, I don't need your things. I don't need the stuff. I just, I need your heart. Come on, I just need your heart. I need what you have inside. You know, in Ezekiel 22, uh, there's, a, there's a long list. If you go read it, it's a long list of things that are unpleasing to God. And we're not going to read out and read the whole list. We're going to hit the very, we're going to hit one of the bottom scriptures. I think it's 30 something, uh, verse 30. So Ezekiel 22, verse 30 says this, and this is the living Bible. It says, I looked in vain for anyone who would build again the wall of righteousness that guards the land, who could stand in the gap and defend you from my just attacks. But I found no one. He says, I need somebody that will stand in that gap. You know, and, and that, I found that interesting. So I, I, need, I, need, I need a couple of volunteers. Margie, can you come stand right here for me? Thank you. Margie's like, yeah, I'll do it. Stand right there. Christy, come on. Sarah, come on. I know. You are awesome. Sarah, come right up here. Chris, come here. Chris is right. Mason, come here. Chris, stand right. Come on. There we go. Hold your. We just get everyone. We just get everyone. Come up. Come up top. Stand behind Chris. Stand behind Martin. Stand right behind Martin. So God said. So these people down here are representing people in the people in the earth. These are people that, that need something from God. These are people that are looking for something from God. Okay, now turn around and look at us real quick. That's you. So grab Margie's hand. Grab Chris's hand. Y'all ready? Y'all 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 are interceding. The people up here are interceding. I want you to get a picture of this, okay? Reach up toward heaven with one hand and reach back. So these people are building the wall. It's the wall of righteousness, right? This is the wall of prayer. These are people. This is the earth right here that needs us. Come on. And this is everybody in this earth that needs us. Right? But he said, I need somebody to stand in the gap. Right? I need somebody to stand in the gap that will close that righteousness. Right? They're the ones that will pray. Is something missing in here? Come on. What's missing? Talk to me. Come on now. She's missing somebody standing in the gap, isn't she? Come on. Come on. She's missing somebody that'll stand in the gap for her. And that'll reach to heaven and say, you're the one God that she needs. And I'm willing to stand in the gap for her. You know, if there's nobody here, if there's nobody willing to stand in the gap for her. See, these people have got somebody standing in the gap for them. They've got somebody that says, I'm willing to close the wall up. I'm willing to do that. But you see, there's other people. You see, but we have to get our eyes off of ourselves. Come on. We have to get our eyes off of ourselves and realize that there's people that have nobody. 
God says, you know, I look upon the earth. And you go through that whole thing of everything that's unpleasing to him. And I kind of think that he looks at America today and says, you know, there's a whole lot of unpleasing. I hate to say it. You know, the laws that were passed in New York break our heart. Thank God Alabama. I don't know if you saw that. Come on now. I'm not. I may become an Alabama fan, but I'm an Arkansas fan. Y'all know that. But come on, Alabama. <laughs> Supreme Court in Alabama, what'd they say? They said that a child in the womb is still a baby. It's still a person. Amen. Come on. Come on. Somebody's got to stand in that gap. Somebody's got to stand in the gap because there's people. There's people that are here that don't have anybody standing in the gap for. You guys realize that? We have a place. If you are saved, and you have a place in heaven. But there's somebody out there in Abilene, in Texas, in America, in the world, that God's calling you to stand in the gap for. Them. Because if you don't stand in the gap for them, if you don't, if you don't do what God asks us to do, come on, who's going to? Thank y'all. Appreciate that. So I want y'all to realize, and, and you know that's something that. That, you know, the visual for me is something I need. You know, when there's there's three people down here, and two of them have people interceding for them, and one of them's just standing there. Right? Come on, one of them's just standing there like, who's, who's, who's praying for me? Amen? Who's interceding for me? Who's crying out for me? Who's going to tell me? Because they don't know. Amen? They don't know. They don't have anybody standing together. You know, he says, I looked in vain for anyone who would build again the wall of righteousness and guard the land. You know, there's a land that we're guarding right now. Amen? Come on. And God just needs somebody. Somebody. And He's looking for somebody. You know, that's the big thing. You know, the Bible says that you know, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Because he just needs somebody. He just needs somebody to stand in the gap. In Luke 14, turn over to Luke 14. And again, I'm in the, I'm in the New Life version. We're going to start with verse 25 of Luke 14. It says, many people followed Jesus. Then he turned around and said to them, If any man comes to me and does not have much more love for me than for, the, than for his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my follower. If he does not carry his cross and follow me, he cannot be my follower. If one of you wanted to build a large building, you would sit down first and think of how much money it would take to build it. You would see if you had enough money to finish it. You would count the cost of what it would take to build this thing, right? I mean, I'm not going to start a house. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done construction since I got out of high school. You know, and I'm not going to start a project unless I know I can finish it. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to put up put up a floor, come on, walls, and then not be able to put a roof on it, right? Because what's going to happen? The elements are going to what? They're going to destroy it, right? I mean, everything, all the work and all the money that I just put into it, if left out of the elements, is going to rot, right? It's going to it's it's not going to stand over time. So I count the cost of you know what's it going to cost me to build a house. What's it going to cost me to put the foundation in and put it in correctly? What's it going to cost me, you know, to put the flooring in and then the walls and then the roof and then the sheep and all? And then what's it going to cost me, you know, to do the drywall inside? And then you got to have doors. Come on. You don't need no doors. Christy said you don't need no doors. You know? So who doesn't count that cost? Who doesn't count the cost of what's it, what is it going to take to do this? You know, and I think a lot of people... Don't count the cost that it takes to follow Jesus sometimes. I don't think a lot of people count.
count the cost when we're take to follow Jesus. Because it seems like we get part way into something. And it's like, mm, I'm having troubles right now. And see, anybody, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm going to raise my hand before I can say it because I don't want to make this say. Uh, but has anybody ever went through a dry season? Come on, anybody ever went through a season that you just feel like, God, what is going on here? Why, why are blessings running from me instead of chasing me down? You know what I mean? Every time I get close, they seem to go the other way. Come on. I've been there. You know, and for years, for years, I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm chasing you, God. I'm following you. And why am I having this dry season? Is there something I'm doing wrong? Has anybody ever felt like I've done something wrong in my dry season? That this, this, this season of, you know, no water in the creek, if you will. You know what I mean? You go down to, 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 to water and to get something, there's nothing there. This season of wondering what's, what's happening. This season of, of giving what you have and giving what you can and doing what you can. And it's like, I'm not getting anywhere. I didn't understand that for years. And I thought, God, is there something? Is there something I'm missing? Am I going through this because I, you know, is there sin in my life that I'm not catching? Is there something? I mean, have y'all felt that way? Come on. I feel like this dry season that I go to and I can't, I just don't understand it. I walk through them and it's like, it just doesn't make sense. You know, your blessings are, you know, I get close and they seem to, you know, they seem to get further away. I just never understood. And I always, and I always would, would take condemnation on myself. You know what I mean? You better done that? Yeah. Take condemnation on myself like I've done something wrong and I just don't know what it is. But I had to have done something wrong otherwise the blessing would be followed. You know, but I realized something during those times. And it took me years. But I realized something. I realized that those dry seasons that I went through, those times when I was reaching to God with everything I had but it just seemed like I came up short. You know, it's almost like all the monkey bars. You know what I mean? And you're just reaching for that next thing. You know what I mean? And it's like, I just came up short. And I'd fall. And I had to climb back around and start over again, right? And I get to the end, it's like I tried again and I come up short again. And I just don't didn't understand for years. And then God spoke this one day. And I really want you to get this. He says the dry seasons aren't that you're doing something wrong. He said the dry seasons are for you pressing in more. The dry seasons aren't that you're doing something wrong. He said I need you to press in more for what's ahead. You know when the when the uh, when the Israelites came out of Egypt they were they were captive for 400 years and they were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. And God used the man, used Moses, to, to, to bring him out. And Moses didn't want to do it. He says, I, I, I stutter when I talk. He says, I can't do anything. He says, I'm, I'm not the man you want to use. What's going on? And why are you using me? God said, no, you're, you're the man. And when they came out, it, it says over, and let's, let's turn over there real quick. Let's turn over there. Let's turn over to, uh, uh, let's go to Exodus 14. Exodus 14. Exodus 14. We're going to start verse 17. It says this. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them the way, the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And here's what I, you know, here's something that I find very interesting. This, this last phrase right here. It says, and the people of Israel went out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. 
He said, I didn't take them by the way of the Philistines because I was afraid that when they saw something as large as the Philistines, he says, I'm afraid that they would turn around and go back and say, I'm going back to captivity. And I'm okay with that. Because they didn't want to come out in the first place. Moses had to say, hey, come on, people. God's pulling you out of this thing, right? God's got something for you. And he says, I could have taken them through because it was closer. I could have taken them through the land of the Philistines. But he says, I didn't do it. Because he says they weren't ready. Yet here at the very end, it says what? It says, and the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. They thought they were ready for the battle. Anybody ever thought that you were ready for something and then it hit you and you're like, what just happened? Come on. They thought they were ready, right? Let's go to the land of the Philistines. We're going to walk right through this thing. We are equipped for battle, right? Come on. We're doing this thing, right? And God said, no, nah. I said, you think you're ready, but I know you're not. I know what you'll do if you see the giants. I'm going to be honest. I've ran up on some giants before. I want to go the other way. <laughs> Come on. God said, I, I, I can't take you that way. So where did he take them? Took them into the wilderness. Took them into a dry spot. Took them in a place they weren't familiar with. Took them to a place uh, that they had to wonder and they had to, what's going on? Why are we going this way when this way was more prosperous? Why am I following this direction when this is, God, I really, I don't understand. See, they didn't quite understand why they were going that way. But God knew exactly why he took them that way. There's things in your life that you're trying to follow. There's places you're trying to go that God's saying you're not equipped yet. You think you're equipped. But God's saying you're not quite there yet. Because when you run up on that giant, says your faith isn't quite where it needs to be yet. says, I need to strengthen you. I need to show you how big I am. And I need to show you how to press into me in this time of need. Amen? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about these dry times. These times when we're walking through something and it's like, I don't understand. And God said, I'm going to take you by the Red Sea. And so he took them over that direction. And the Bible says, he says that they had actually went past the place that he wanted them to go. And you've got to figure hundreds of thousands of people coming out of here, right? It takes a while to go past the place that, you know what I mean? For the last person in the back of the line, you know, it's hard to get people to even, you know, a couple, 20 people to follow. Come on, hundreds of thousands, you know what I mean? Come on. And so they go past it. It actually says a little later in Exodus there, it says that. He told them to turn around and go back and camp by the Red Sea. You see, God took them and He positioned them in a place. Because the place that He put them was a place that there was only two ways out. You either cross the sea, which they had no way to do, or you go back. But look, the enemy is chasing me. I can't go back and I can't go forward. God put them in a place that they had to put complete and total dependence on Him. Amen? Everything that He had to do, everything they had to believe for. So now they've got the enemy behind them and the sea in front of them. And you know what they start doing? They start complaining. Just saying. <laughs> Raise my hand before I even ask the question. Start complaining. Start getting on to Moses. Moses, what in the world were you doing? We were better back then. You know, we were slaves. <laughs> and we didn't have our own stuff. But we had food. Come on. You ever get to a place that it felt so hard that before you, a miracle had to happen before you? Or it's like I'm going to turn around? And the enemy's just going to destroy you. You ever been there? You ever been where whatever's in front of you, whatever's happening right there has got to be a miracle. You know, we've got several people in the church right now that are staring at something. They're staring at something saying, i got to have a miracle. 
You know, when you get in a situation to where, the, like, like they were at, they're, they're at the Red Sea, you know, not one of them said, God, we're either going to walk on water or you're going to split the sea, but that's the only two choices I have. But then God told Moses, He says, hey, He said, lift up your hands. He said, part the sea so that you can walk through. You see, God had to take them in a direction because had they went to the Philistines, they'd have turned around and ran back to Egypt. But God put them in a position where they can't go back. They can't go back. And God said, I'm, I'm doing something. Read the rest of Exodus. It says, I'm doing something because I'm going to get the glory out of this. You see, a lot of times when we're doing things, we want the glory. But God said, I'm going to put you somewhere. It may be a place that you don't want to be. It may be a place that you, don't, you think you don't need to be. But I'm going to place you there because I want you to have complete and total dependence on me. And so he told him, go back, camp here, because that's where my miracle awaits you. Have you ever thought that what you're going through is simply a place to camp for a miracle to happen? If we looked at it different, if our perspective was different, amen, if the things that we thought about were different, and we think about it like, you know what, well, I, I, I've reached this place, and it's either a miracle or bust. You know, Farrah and I, um, I wasn't going to share this, but I'll, I'll share it, so God's put it on my heart. But Farrah and I, back last, last April, so you guys know, you know, we sold our cabinet shop and we sold everything. We, we moved to Abilene and God made a way. And then, you know, then he stretched us and put us in a place we didn't want to be because he made us move to Launch State in six months. And so that made me think, I don't know how well this is going to happen, right? And so we get, to, we get to the middle of April last year. And our bank account was zero. It was April 14th. And the reason I know that is I had a bill coming out on April 15th. And it was a fairly large bill that we had to do. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, you know what? I would, I would, I would have worked if you'd asked me to work. I would have done anything outside of, of launching this church that you asked me to do. I'll go do it. I'll go, you know, I don't have a problem with working. I don't have a problem with doing things. I said, I would have done anything. I said, but you didn't ask me to do that. I said, you asked me to step out in faith and you asked me to come to a point in my life that I'm here. God, and all the money that we had, all the money that we had to launch in January was gone. Because now we had to start living with it, right? Come on. So now we reached the place, it was April 14th, and I'm sitting on my couch in my living room. Farrah's getting ready to go somewhere. I hadn't really told Farrah what was going on. But I'm sitting there on the couch, I'm exactly where I was sitting. This is one of those cornerstones. Come on. This is one of those stones that I place as a miracle. Amen. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm just having a conversation with God. Farrah comes in. She's, 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 I don't even remember exactly where she was going. That wasn't really my, <laughs> where I was at at the time. So I'm sitting there on the couch and I'm like, God, I will do anything you want me to do. You know, you ask me to sell my business. You ask me to move to Avalon. You ask me to do these things. And I know without a doubt, you know, you have to get to a place where God asks you to do something and you step out on those things. You better come to a place to realize that this is it. Come on. This is what God asked me to do. He asked me to move and he planted me by the Red Sea, if you will. Because now I'm at a place that I have to have a miracle in front of me and I can't go behind me. I can't go by so I'm sitting there on the couch. And we, and, and, I, and I, you know, and, and we, you ever try to figure things out yourself? <laughs> Come on. You know, if I do this and I do that, and I, you know, this is going on, and this is happening, and this is really going on, and maybe this will work out. And I knew that I had a check coming from the cabinet shop, but it wasn't coming until June. So we're a month and a half of bills before we get to it, right? So I'm sitting there on the couch, and I'm just having a conversation with God. And I just, Lord, I just thank you. I'm doing what you asked me to do. If you ask me to go dig a pipeline in South Dakota, I'm going to dig a pipeline in South Dakota. That's not what you asked me to do. But I know you're faithful. I know you're faithful. 
And Lord, I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to do the best that I can do. I said, but I've hit a wall. I said, you know there's a bill due tomorrow that I can't pay. I said, our account's down to just about nothing right now. But that's where we're at. I said, but I'm following you. And so Farrah leaves, and I'm still sitting on the couch. And I'm just, I'm just thanking the Lord. Lord, I just, I just thank you. I don't know where it's coming from. Do I, do I need to sell something? Do I need to, you know what I mean? Do I have something that, you know, Lord, just, just speak to me? Because I'm, I'm willing. I'll do anything. So I'm sitting here on the couch. Farrah actually, before she left, she actually had went and she had got the mail and she brought the mail back and she sat there beside the couch. And so I just reached over and I said, oh, are you fixing to leave? She said, yeah, I'm heading wherever. And I said, okay. And I reached over and I'm going through the mail. And the check that was supposed to come a month and a half later came that day. You can give him a hand clap. Come on. <laughs> I got it all day, y'all. Yeah, I didn't have anything to do with it. You know what I mean? But I knew that I was doing what God asked me to do. Right. You know, I don't, you know, I, and I wouldn't tell anybody any of that up until today because we're at a place, you know what I mean? That was one of our cornerstones that we had to place, something we had to go through, something I had to go through, because I had to be complete and total dependence on him. But I had to know what he told me to do. You know, he told the Israelites what to do. He told Moses what to do. The sea parted, they walked through. Egyptians followed them, you know, and, and, and in one place, and I found this, I was talking with somebody last night, and I was kind of laughing at this, but, you know, at the, toward the end of, of um, Exodus 14 there, it says that when, when, when the Israelites got completely through, and they turned around, and the Egyptians were getting stuck in mud because everything was watered back down. You know, God, God told Moses, He said, Moses, said, raise your hands back up. He said, and make the seed come back together and make it come back as it was before. So, I mean, y'all know I read the Bible kind of different, right? But, so I, I just, and this is, I just wondered last night, I was just wondering, so if Moses didn't raise his hands back up, would the water still be parted? Okay. So that was my thought last night. So I'm just, you know, because he did, he said, he said turn around, put your hands back up, and then and, and, and what if Moses said, hey, can we just leave this part? This would be kind of cool, you know what I mean? So anyway. But guys, I don't know where you're at in your walk. I don't know what miracle you need in front of you. I know what miracle I need in front of you. I know what I'm believing for in today. I know the things that I need from God today. I know there's several people uh, that go to church here, and a lot of them aren't here because they're going through illness and sicknesses and things um, that they need miracles in their life. Amen. But I know a God that performs the miracles. Yeah. I know a God that will tell you to use what you have. He told Moses, what do you got? Lift your hands up. So wherever you're at today, whatever you're going through, whatever the things that you're, you're focused on, I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you to focus on God. I just want to encourage you to focus on what He has for you. Because the dry place that you're in right now where the, the creek bed, it ain't got no water in it. Maybe a time that he's just asking you to press in deeper. Maybe a time that God's just saying, you know what, this, this, this place that I positioned you, I'm going to put you in the position for you to receive a miracle, but I need you to trust in you. Amen? So I just want to encourage you in that today. We're going to, we're going to go ahead. Kirk, will you come up? Will you and the band come back up? We're going to take communion. In this time of communion, you know, the, the Bible says to, to take this, and every time you do it, remember what he did. To do this in remembrance of you. And so we're going to take communion this morning, and um, you know, I just want you to think about where you're at in your life. I want you to think about what's going on in your life. I want you to think about the Red Sea that you're facing in front of you and the enemy that's pushing you behind you. And I want, you to, I want you to, as we take communion today, I want you to realize, I want you to realize and to lean on God. Amen. So you know, one thing that you know, a lot of different churches do things differently. You know, and, and, and we do, we do open churches. Um, you know, God put this on my heart years ago because, you know, I've had people ask me how you do communion or why you do it a certain way or you allow me to 
anybody, everybody can take it. I'll take it live. Number one, I don't know where you're at in your life. But you know, Jesus allowed the man who was fixing to betray him to take the view. With the sin that he had on his heart, with the sin that was with him, he allowed Judas to take that and have the view. So it's not my place to say that you're not in a place to take the people. We do all the things we do, and I just wanted to share that. Um, but you know, Jesus took the bread and he said, hey, this is my body that was broken for you. And this is a personal statement to you and God. You know, I don't know what you're going through again, and I don't know where you're at. But it said, remember these things as you do this, right? Remember what I've done for you. Remember me. His body was broken for us. So that we can have healing. We can have blessings. We can have everything that He wanted us to have. And so as we as we, as we take the bread today, I just want you to think about your own body. And where you're at. And what you need. Because this is between you and God. But I want you to, to trust today that He's got you. Amen. He's got you. So, Father, today, Lord, as we take this bread, we remember the sacrifice of the body that was broken for us. We remember what you did upon that cross, the need that you took. And, and we thank you. We thank you for doing that for us. We thank you that you are a just God and a wonderful God. So, Father, as we say this today, we thank you. Go ahead and take it. You know, and then afterwards, I said they took the cup. We said this represents the blood. And that blood that was spilled on the cross was for you. You know, the, the sacrifice no longer had to be made. The sacrifice no longer of, of bulls and goats and of, of, of doves, they didn't have to be done anymore. Because what he was saying was, when I shed the blood on the altar, he said, when I shed the blood, he said, it's done. He said, that you, you no longer have to do these things because I'm making the way. Amen. So he shed his blood for us. He took upon him what we should have. On us. He took something that we were supposed to take. It's just because he loved us. And so that blood that, that ran down the cross is filled with the light around his precious blood. It was blood of 100 percent man and 100 percent God. He gave us a way to And so Father today.
grass season and I, I, I turned my back on God because I didn't realize what the dry season was for. And so those two invitations for you need to come back to know Him the first time. Is there anybody in here that God's putting this on your heart this morning? Thank you. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Thank you. So if you guys would pray this with me, pray it, pray it. Everyone pray it so that these that raise their hand, we can pray this with them. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, come into my life today. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sins. Become my Savior. Become my Lord. I choose to follow you today. No matter what happens. Thank you. Thank you for coming today.